I think it, you got two different scenes. I mean, there's the Rice Boy scene, and then there's, you know, the faster car scene. You know, as far as, like, guys that aren't into the body kits and shit like that, like, as far as that getting bigger, that's cool. But, like, as far as the Rice Boy shit, you don't, like, you don't really got to worry about the Rice Boys with the clear taillights and stuff like that, whatever. You know, they're going to go to their car shows. But, I mean, it's good that more people are getting into it as far as, like, you know, building motors and having nice, you know, clean cars done properly. That's cool. It's always cool to meet more people like that, you know. As with any passion or hobby, we can all remember our first experiences and what got us hooked. The people in this film come from different areas and are different ages, yet all share a love for automobiles and import tuning. This love resulted from different reasons, yet the outcomes were always the same. How I got into this whole import mess, uh, well, I dreamt about it for a long time riding around in my mini truck, so I already claimed myself to being a part of the import scene because I didn't drive a, a domestic car. I'm originally from Alabama. I guess the uh, accent will give that away right away. But the true heart of the South, the true heart of NASCAR, I have nothing to do with NASCAR. I've never had any inspirations for NASCAR. And I uh, grew up racing motorcycles, you know, Yamaha, flat track. So I already had a love for the Japanese bikes. And uh, I remember growing up always wanting a 1980 to 83 GTI. And my brother and myself just racing all the back roads of Alabama, you know, just like if I would have only known about rally then. I've been into cars my whole life, really. I mean, ever since I could speak, walk, crawl. I remember being, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14, just walking home from school and seeing all the older kids with their cars. When I was 16, I, I met a couple of guys um, that were really into uh, cars, um, mostly import cars. When I finally got a car, you know, I looked up to this one guy, his name was Jebo Lopez, and he was kind of like an a, a, a older brother to me because uh, um, he was also Filipino and he was really into cars and that's what kind of sparked my interest. My roommate, my roommate now, which was my good friend since fifth grade, he picked up a 98 Type R when we were in high school and that set it off. Yeah, there was like a group of us. First it was like me and my friend Dylan, Eric had a car. We all skated together basically, and then we all, all eventually got, car, got into cars. Before I even got my driver license, I was going with older friends to the street races. Actually, Catman and a, and a couple other guys, um, we'd meet up with them and go to the street races, so I was hooked. We were at a family party, and we noticed one of our older cousins. He had a 95 uh, Civic Coupe. Uh, Civic Coupe, yeah. yeah. White, was lower and had like, 95 yeah. GSRs on him. Yeah, he, he came up from the from the Bay. Yeah, in the Bay Area, and then we started uh, like learning all his tricks and stuff with the Hondas. I don't know. I was just looking for something different, you know. And then you know, we all like three of my buddies also got Hondas too. And um, I went to Tampa, which is what really got me into it. And I saw my buddy John had a CRX with a B16 in it. And this was back in '97, so I took a ride in it, and that was it. That was you know, what, what got me into it completely. And then I ended up getting a 93 hatch, and it took a little while before I got my first motor, but then once I got a B16, I decided to put it in myself, and I mean, there was a lot of problems along the way because I was just 17 at the time. Yeah, I'm all self-taught, and I mean, I learned through trial and error, you know? And it was me and a couple of my other buddies, they started, you know, of course we started, you know, just getting the intake and the header and that kind of stuff like that, but then once we actually started, you know, doing the motor swaps, it was me and my one buddy, Chris, we you know, we just really got into it. Oh, it all started with bikes, just basic mechanics. Wanting to work on something is kind of just where I started with anything, just wanting to put my hands on stuff. And then it, 
it moved into wanting to work on the cars. Obviously, turning 16, you got to be able to drive. You got to be able to do something with something. And it just started with a, a 90 Accord and, and went from there. And I just built stuff up. And it's just like you, you just hate being the same. You want to be different. You want to do something different. And you just kind of build it. project car, the driving force behind everyone in this film. Although each project car is different, and every person's style is different, all tuners will agree that a project car becomes much more than just a car. You know, when you're into it, you're into it. It consumes you. It's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's all your money. It's all your time. You know, it, it turns out to be your girlfriend. It turns out to be, like, all of your friends that you surround yourself with. Everybody knows what you do and how much you do it, and it's its the greatest thing when you can make it work right. This guy flips through cars like Dude. these women. All right. Oh, hey. I, I wasn't in a name of my car. Lisa, I Angela, think Pamela, Renee. Renee. <laughs> I love you. Come around the way. My favorite was my blue CRX because it was like when the transplants just came in, so we put LS motor and and uh, no, um, it, was it, was, it was LS with uh, JT301 cams. Uh, yeah, like blue, 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 like. Yeah, and I remember like racing El Natural. And, uh, and uh, that was fun. Those those are the fun days. The white Dosol, soul, the flat black. Or EF, I had a black DA. Yeah, I sold my hatch, yeah, sold my hatch to my, my father, turned it back to stock, because he always wanted the car, good mileage or whatever, and then bought the first Type R over Roden, which is behind me, bought that for my roommate. Pulled the turbo, it was a fully built dart and solid deck sleeves, you know, turbo, all that crap. Sold it, got a 11.6 uh, to 1 bottom end setup in there. And got some plans, keep it clean. They do a black EK hatch from there. I got out of it a little bit, yeah. bought a BMW, hated it. I didn't hate it, I just got a little you bit. Loved I got it. bit. You loved that was it. A, that was a different BMW. Oh, okay. I didn't know BMW before that. Uh, got bit by the bug again. Jumped in, got my second four-door EF, the silver one. My first car uh, that of one of my recent builds was uh, a 1990 Honda Civic EF. It was a sedan. Um, I kind of chose that car at that time because I was really actually, the whole story was, I was really actually looking for an EG at the time, but at the time they were going for about five grand, six grand for a stock one, a nice clean one, and um, I didn't really want to spend that much money on that, because I'm, you know, just like anybody else, a budget, you know, race room, you know, budget builder and whatnot, and um, I used to have a quarter in high school, and so my plan was to get an EG back then, you know, because of the whole price thing, I said, you know what, why don't I just take it back with something that what I, what I used to have, so I bought a, a Ford Civic 1990 Civic, and um, a lot of people at, at the time were um, really cautious as far as you know turboing it and whatnot. And those were my big plans to show that you can turbo a nor um, basically out of the junkyard, you know, an import yard motor, and just do, through fine tuning and, and whatnot, you wouldn't have any problems. That was kind of like my whole story to that. I've always been into the whole Japanese look. The look in Japan is, is different than it is here in the U.S. In Japan, they have a one-piece headlight. It's got a different hood. It's got a different fender. It's actually got a grill, just like an old-school Accord. Um, and I sourced it and decided to put that together, built that together, um, got the fine-tuning out as far as tuning the, the turbo. Um, also kind of put together uh, a lot of stuff that I researched on, which is um, HKS B-Series manifold, which is a hardware piece to find these days because at that time HKS didn't come full force with their uh, B-Series turbo kit. And I was able to source that. It was a fun project. I learned a lot from that. All of the people in this film can remember their first projects and can relate to the feeling of working countless hours, all to afford that one rare part that they just had to have and finally achieving a personal goal or idea relating to their cars. As, as, as weird as it sounds, I tell you, and I, I don't know if anyone could relate to me that will watch this video, but my first car, you know, like I said, was a 94 GSR. 
and I've owned some pretty nice supercars throughout the years. You know, of course, being an enthusiast, I've owned, you know, anything from S2000s, Type R's, you know, Evolution. I mean, anything in general. So, but it, you know, nothing ever gives you that feeling your first car does. You know, it's like when you get your first license, you get you get that car, you get a set of wheels. It's like you always remember that in your mind. You know. But uh, as far as, and personally, in favor, I've always been an enthusiast of the, the Integra Type R. Um, it was, like I said, coming into Integra, so you always look up to the top model that you can't have, you know? And that was, that was the one. So, you know, now today I own two of them, but <laughs> as, cra as crazy as it sounds. But um, yeah, definitely I'm an enthusiast uh, of, of all cars. I've owned Del Sol's, you know, you know ha any hatch, every hatchback body style you can imagine, so. I got into high school and a couple of my friends started getting into the same stuff. and. Eventually, I picked up my first my first car, a '94 Civic CX hatchback, um, pretty much the lowest model they made, and uh, set out to set out to do a bunch of stuff to it. And uh, from there, it was got a lot further than I ever expected. Your car, Slow Turtle, was about so many things. It's about you know just being able to get away from everybody. We just sat in the garage, did our own thing. Nobody gave us grief for it. Working on that car was just. It was exciting, you know, like it just brought us together and uh, I still remember the first day that we got my car started. I mean, after all that work, it didn't have a hood on it at the time. It had, I don't even think the lights were working because we had torn everything apart. And that day that we got the motor running, we just, you know, took it around with my friends, kind of a kind of a desolate area. And we ended up getting uh, pulled over by a fire truck, of all things, who saw the car, you know, in shambles and it was loud. The header was like barely connected. and no exhaust and it was just super loud and we were just dirty there was no seat belts in it and we were just laughing you could not take the smile off of our face because you know we did it we we did something that we were really involved with and really into and it was funny that we got pulled over for it being so loud but we didn't even care you know just that excitement of of seeing that happen i know it's always like funny stories like when when you're working on cars because i mean at first like when you do it yourself you like you do a swap yourself and you, you learn a lot doing a swap yourself, you learn a lot of problems. Um, I remember one time I was doing a swap for, for my friend Craig Fowler, we were at my parents' house doing it, and we were up like, I think I was buying his motor out of his car, as a Type R motor, a Japanese Type R, and I had my stock motor in my car at the time because I sold my US Type R motor and I wanted his. So we were putting my stock DX motor into his car and his Type R motor into my car, and we were working all night. I mean, it was like probably four in the morning and we were like dead tired. And uh, I just fell asleep. I went in my room and passed out. And Craig was still under his car, like with, on jack stand. The car was on jack stand. He was under his car and he fell asleep. <laughs> I was too tired to even wake him up. Like he woke up at like five in the morning and like he opened his eyes and the car was like right above him. He's like he like freaked out. Like he didn't really know where he was at or anything. And he was all pissed for not me not waking him up. But that was that was kind of a funnier story then. Yeah, my car was definitely more than just a hobby. It was indeed a lifestyle for me because I mean I wouldn't just like. I wouldn't just go home and be like, oh, there's my car, you know, I'm going to start working on it. But it was more like, you know, this car, I dream, I dream about that car. I dreamed about what it would be like and, you know, it consumed all my friends and everything around me, you know, like, like I would go to work, not just to work, but I would work for my car and that's all, what all my paychecks went to, you know, it wasn't just like my car was my side hobby, my car was my life, you know, at that time. And I dumped, you know, hours, blood, sweat tears into that car, you know, it was, it was everything to me and, and I guess it showed, you know. Another DA, I think I've had three DAs and all, I think I'm missing one. Something about DAs and EFs I just love. Uh, from there, I had an EG Coupe, another EK hatch. Yeah, my Type R was the first car I ever really put together myself, by myself, you know, <clears throat> without outside assistance. It was a theft recuff, so it had no interior, no motor, nothing like that. And I'm getting a, JDM motor swapped it in, did the seats, just kind of put it back together. It's a really good feeling to actually do something, you know, yourself without assistance and kind of just your own knowledge. And With the EG, I knew that the, out, the outside body would be just like any other EG. A lot of them are just subtle like that, so I wasn't looking for the big body kit or rim or whatnot. Um, the real main focus was uh, all in the engine bay. And that's what I wanted to set apart from the rest of all the other parts. And, I think uh, one of the main contributing factors of why I did the way I did with the engine bay is because I did a lot, you know, I was always into hot rods and, um, you know, watching the learning channel, American Hot Rod and a bunch of these other guys, um, I said, you know what, I want to 
build a nice, clean aesthetic, clean, perfect looking engine bay. And that's what I wanted to do. So that's when we went ahead and shaved the whole engine bay, uh, redesigned the brake system, um, just basically cut the firewall to flush out a lot of it and make it look, you know, from factory, not, not change it up too much, but just with all the imperfections as far as the holes and whatnot, filled them all up and uh, that's what we ended up nice. with that car. That itch is always gonna be within you, whether, you know, I've even said it before, I said I don't think I could ever drive a stock car, a totally stock car. It's just not in my nature just because I've always had that itch for fixing a car. To be able to complete something, to actually get it done and say, this car's done, I finished this one, um, was the most exciting feeling ever. And especially to get feedback from people that's positive and know and see and recognize what you did and how much time you put into it just means the world to me. For me, it was everything. And it was everything for the entire time I was working on the project and it consumed me. And it was, you know, the, exactly what I wanted with a finished product. It was exactly what I wanted. And to see it go on paper and to be able to work with, you know, just everybody that I worked with was just a blessing. Everything fell into place and it just came out as the most exciting thing we've ever done. They're never finished. The thing about cars is they're never yeah. finished. Even if someone says, well, my car's finally finished, bullshit. Dude, there's something that you want to change. It's no, never, I think every time. My coworker said this today too. He's like, every time you ask a person, should, you know, it's almost done. It's all, <laughs> almost the answer done. is, anytime you ask, it's almost done. But I, you'll see, you'll see stuff on the internet. Oh, I finished my project. I finished my car. Here it is. I'm like, well, shit. Two weeks later, you want new wheels. Two weeks later, there's something else out. Something bigger, something better that you want to buy for your car. It's just, it's part of. It's just what's what's in you. You know, you keep building, keep building. It never ends. JDM. 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 A la JDM. Oh, JDM. Oh, cool. <laughs> JDM. Three letters that have taken on quite a legacy among the import tuning community. Whether loved or hated, JDM must be recognized as a serious change in the way enthusiasts tuned and modified their cars. There is a difference now between JDM cars that were around back then and the JDM cars that are around now. Uh, I think the JDM thing is a scene. I think it's more a way of how you view life, and I appreciate that the JDM aspect is there because it, it's like how a skateboarder views the terrain around him. He's like, oh, dude, check, I can hit that lip right there. I can roll like that. I can hit this thing right there. Well, JDM-ism is kind of like the same. It's a, it's a thought process. It's like, it's how I want my car to look. It's how I want my car to be perceived. It's, it's my appreciation for the Honda make itself. The term was coined sometime in the late 1990s and refers to the origins of a somewhat different style of import tuning. Although there is no single right definition, the term is often used to describe the style which was emerging primarily out of Southern California in the 1990s that emphasized clean, Japanese exterior parts with an overall emphasis on function and devoting more money into the motor and suspension. In high school we never thought of this whole coined word JDM thing just because you know, some people would define it as, you know, is it from Japan, just parts from Japan? Does that, that, does that make your car JDM? Or, or just this whole clean look as like OEM look? Or, I mean, to me, I've always just had that whole taste as far as just really clean, subtle. Even when we had, you know, body kits and whatnot, it's always been pretty, you know, laid back and clean. That's basically the kind of look that I've always gone, gone for. With the introduction of the internet, people began to notice this style was becoming more popular nationwide. The people who started this style, however, did not feel it was anything worth talking about. They didn't consider themselves pioneers or trendsetters. They were just buying the quality parts they wanted and keeping a style they enjoyed. I mean, back in 95, there really wasn't anything that wasn't real Japanese stuff out. There was no fake rims or fake anything, you know what I mean? It was just like, you wanted nice rims, you'd get, you know, Mugen or racing hard or whatever else you wanted to get. What we wanted to go after, at least what I thought I wanted to go after was FS Quad. I think they just kind of set the trend in so many ways. It was like the basic the basic B-Series swap, but then you got your JDM goodies over here and it had, it had all kinds of flavor and style to it. And Seattle area didn't have any of that. And it was just kind of like, 
when you saw a car like that set up, that was a big deal. And it wasn't a lot of money, and it wasn't fiberglass everywhere, and it wasn't, you know, 17, 18 inch rims. It was a big deal to have five lug, 15 inch rims, and just all kinds of stuff that you can't go to the store and buy. Well, the stuff that we bought was expensive stuff, and we didn't have a choice. So it's definitely, it was definitely about the saving game as far as, as much, you know, putting money away to get these certain parts. I mean, something as, you know, the corner light, you know, back, back in 93, they were charging $160 for this. And, you know, it's just, it's crazy. And, um, you know, nowadays, because there's so many different sources out, um, those are a lot more easily accessible. So like around 98, late 98, I started uh, selling Type R parts on the internet, typearparts.com at the time. You know, on Honda Tech and all them other sites, we were doing the same kind of stuff. But from the transition from 99 till 2001, it was just, just an explosion of like, you know, it went from like five calls a day to like probably 50 calls a day. And it was people buying the same type, you know, like it was, I, I would say 2001 is when it was really getting huge, where people were calling all the time for Type R pistons. And then I actually, you know, had enough customers where I could start bringing in, you know, forged pistons and doing stuff like that. But compared to back in, you know, the way it was in 99, there wasn't a whole lot of action, 98, 99, you know, and then from the time when I left in 02, it was, you know, insane. You know, like every day, 50 phone calls at least, you know, people getting timing belts, full rebuilds, bearings, you know, it seemed like a lot of people were starting to build their own motors then. Kind of like the Southern California street race scene where everything was NA, you know? It wasn't necessarily about being JDM, it was it just kind of, morphed into that. Everybody was spending money on motors and stuff. Over time, magazines, car shows, and internet forums were associating the three letters with everything, from wheels, paint, and motors, to seats, culture, and even people. The desire for this style was huge. I mean, if I compared my EG back then, 98, to what today, it would be nothing because it's so, it's gone so far beyond yeah, like totally. what it is, you know, what I, it was. I called him up the other day. Yeah, how is Nisa? He says, uh, 1998 called, they want their style though. Now that the JDM scene is the JDM scene and it's all JDM'd out and it's just like, rah, you know, it's like, all right, cool. Well then like, I sit here and look at it and be like, what can I possibly do to, to contribute? But it's like, okay, well, JDM hit this wall right here of like, what can I do to contribute? I want to inspire beyond, you know, the, the guys that are making the scene happen. Okay, what's next? It's like, well, what about JDM Rally? What about JDM Trucks? What about JDM Asics Shoes? It's like, here are all these kids rocking the Nike Dunks, but if you're so freaking JDM out, why aren't you rocking the Asics? Point blank. You know, if you want to get silly with it, then get silly with it. You know, I got a JDM toothbrush. All right, there you go, Johnny Wong. How's that? <laughs> I'll brush my teeth. Anything that's gonna get hot is gonna get cold and vice versa. And if you're really into it, you're really into it. Those guys that are really down and like, you know, grind and go to Japan and buy their stuff are always gonna love it. And then you've got those people that are just in it for the money. And there will be that for anything, any style, you know, any generation. And I myself see it as, you know, personalization. Somebody wants something that, that other people can't have, and to a certain extent, and to extreme extents at some point, you know, just wanting to get something that's so, so rare that nobody else can touch it. And it's different for everybody. Somebody's personality is gonna want that really rare part just to throw in somebody's face. And somebody else is gonna want it because they picture this part in their head, in some junkyard, all the way in Japan, that they wanna go and find themselves, and it's a treasure hunt. And it's just, it's, it's different for everybody, and I mean, I think there's people that do it because they like that style, they like that flavor, and they're gonna buy the parts that are the knockoff, and they like that look, and that's fine. And they'll be done with the industry in two, three months. They're gonna lose that flavor, they're gonna lose that passion, but there's somebody that's gonna, you know, read a magazine five years into now with like an 88 Civic and some old Mugens on it, and they're gonna love it to death. As of today, many people still appreciate the style and feel it's going strong, while others feel it's a quickly dying trend. No one can predict the future trends and styles of import tuning, but most will agree, racing, function, and creativity will always be in the forefront for true enthusiasts. Racing is something people must experience to truly understand. There are countless forms and styles of racing. In the United States import scene, drag racing is the most prevalent. Like most forms of racing, import drag racing spawned on the street. 
Eventually, events like Test and Tune, as well as Battle of the Imports, became more and more popular, allowing tuners to test their cars in the quarter mile safely and build affordable, yet very powerful motors. JDM-styled cars, however, were tuned in a way that was traditional to circuit racing. Road racing, or circuit racing, has yet to become as big in the United States as it is in Japan. You know, Honda made this, you know, Mugen is their aftermarket parts guy, you know, there's all these other companies working with it. Well, I want the same things that, like, I see in the best motoring videos on the racetrack, because that's the thing about, I, I think JDM, the, the aspects of, hasn't quite come to the realization of, is racing is the ultimate inspiration. Racing never goes out of style. And function of racing is the fashion. Function is the fashion. So if you have a properly functioning car, it'll never go out of style. It will always be in fashion because everyone loves racing, hands down. That's, that is what has inspired this scene from day one, is racing. It originated with the, you know, the Rice Boy stuff, the typical, you know, intake and exhaust and stuff like that. And then after going to the, all the street races and going through all the magazines, had a su subscription to all the, you know, turbo magazines, sport compact car, I mean, you name it. Um, going through there and then um, just wanted to do, you know, whatever I could. And I always wanted to turbocharge it because of uh, Arthur's G20. And, um, you know, from day one, I was like, yeah, I'm going to turbocharge it. I'm going to run 13s, you know, whatever. And, Started taking it to the track and uh, Mission Raceway was up here and uh, went there a couple times and um, you know running 15s um, bone stock and uh, yeah that car I had for um, I would say three years and um, turbocharged it within the first I would say four or five months and um, it was a pretty basic setup stock B18C had a 204B turbo on it custom turbo kit. Um, and that made around 250 at the wheels until I uh, picked up my first sponsor, Import Special Automotive in Tacoma. And Donnie there had a dyno and got into my first um, engine management system with that. And that was the PMS system and tuned in another 50 horsepower, ran 13 O's on street tires. Yeah, and I remember going up to Mission and back, back then there was, you know, 95% domestics and there'd be four or five of us Honda guys hiding in a corner, you know getting weird looks from all these, you know, domestic guys as we rolled in and yeah, and started running 13s with that car and started turning some heads. That motor didn't last very long because obviously it, it blew up. One after that had actually fully built, turbocharged and then uh, ran mid 12s with that one. And then people were starting catching up running 12 or 13, low 13s. And then, yeah, I started, decided to switch gears, go all motor and did a fully built, two all-motor uh, setups and ran 12s with both of them. Many tuners are finally realizing the potential of their cars and the excitement that goes into a road racing event. The future of road racing, in conjunction with hybrids and other Hondas, looks very, very bright. Not that we've always understood the racing inspiration from Japan because we've bought, borrowed, and stole every aspect of Japanese culture aside from the racing because Japan is in the circuit racing. And here we are drag racing these cars, taking every road racing part and putting it on a drag race car. Uh, no. So that part of it has yet to come to us. I think it's slowly getting there, but for me, there's still hope. There's still, you know, forward motion. There's still, you know, room to grow. I was trying to hit a track events. Right, right when I built that car is when I got into work, road racing. And uh, actually Eric B was, he, he lived up in San Francisco and he was kind of like my mentor, I guess you could say. And he knew Tommy that was just here. Tommy was like, he's more of the road racing than Eric B is, but I hooked up with them. I went to, went to a couple of speed trials events back in like 99, around 99 or so. And uh, I started that off. I've been going ever since. As far as the style, I mean, I see a lot of people that are putting like really like nice track parts on their car, not really using them. And I see a lot of people who are putting parts on their car, like starting to think, well, 
on different part of the track and see how these parts work, you know what I mean? So actually starting to use the parts. I think more and more people are starting to like get into road racing and like using the parts of what they're what they're for, you know. So hopefully like that'll continue and I think case are gonna really like just pick up and you know just V series is gonna die out eventually. I heard of a track event going down at Pacific Ra Raceways down in Kent, Washington. Um, and the event was being held by a &J Racing up in Vancouver. You know, I've always looked up to them, I've always sourced them for some car parts, and uh, I got in contact with them to see if I could hook up with them and join their event. So what they offered me was like a whole day of track racing, not drag racing, like track racing, going around the whole track, you know, turning and turning, shucking and jiving, using your whole car for, for what it was built for, uh, for like a whole day, you know, and it was like, it was like 200 bucks. Which is, which is cheap compared to seat time, compared to price, you know? And it was an experience, you know? Like, at every corner, I thought I was gonna die. Which, I guess, you know, is what you're supposed to do when you're racing, you know? If you feel like you're in total control of a car, then you ain't driving it fast enough. And that was my whole theory, you know, I scared the shit out of my, my, uh, my co-driver and that was my first time driving and this dude was like a professional, uh, like Porsche track racer, you know, but I took my car out there with the ANJ boys and I was keeping my own, you know, smoking like a uh, couple C, uh, C32s and, you know, all these AMG Benzes, uh, you know, a couple RSXs and S2000s, but Benz S2000 from ANJ fucking whooped my ass. <laughs> And during the whole drag racing time with the Integra, I had picked up a few sponsors and they all were into the road racing um, side of stuff. And they were constantly going to the track, doing track days, and constantly trying to get, get me to go. And it wasn't until, I would say, middle of 2003 or something when I actually went to one and, and watched, and I was, wow, this is totally fun. And uh, don't get me wrong, drag racing is fun and stuff, but it only lasts for, you know, 12 seconds at a time. So after I got the Supra, and I ended up selling the Integra, got a Hondas for about three or four months, and you know, once you've got the itch, it comes back to bite you, you know, and started going to road racing and bought this uh, hatch that I have here, decided to go, hey, I'm gonna go road race and do the club racing thing, and um, planned to do it last year, but you know, things just didn't work out, ended up blowing a motor at the track. Got the itch again earlier this year, finally, you know, got off my ass and finished up this car and uh, prepped it, got my license, started doing the local club racing tour here, and uh, yeah. Whether it is drag racing, road racing, or even street racing, racing itself is what inspires all motorsports enthusiasts. In the early years of Honda tuning, several import car magazines were born. Although the shelves are now filled with countless import car magazines, in the early days there were only a few. Sport Compact Car, Super Street, and TMR were the three best known and began exposing people to a culture and style that many didn't know existed. TMR itself had a different feel. This magazine had many more photos than the rest and its editor, Rodney Wells, viewed it as a way to show as much of what was going on in the Southern California tuning scene as possible. Ken and RJ and myself all sat down and says, well, you know, if the, if the magazine is not gonna really support our scene, the way we saw that we wanted them to support the scene, then the only thing we can do is start our own magazine. And uh, I had this little, uh, you know, idea, and I live in Costa Mesa. I've worked 10 years in the snow, skate, and surf industry. And there was this little bitty magazine that was getting handed out at ASR and the little local shops around my house. And yeah, it was this thing called Electric Ink. It was like about the, you know, the surf community, skate community around there, and I'm like, this is perfect. I mean, I've been going to battle for six years and watching what was happening. And, and me being a graphic designer at that time, I'm like, there's a huge problem with getting, you know, stuff in the kids' hands at the shows. It's like, you know, the kid, you know, a guy's there with his girlfriend and he's holding the drinks and holding their purse and his backpack and, you know, and all these manufacturers are there trying to give the kids stuff and the guy's like, Psh, whatever. And so I'm like, man, it's a huge problem just getting the guy to take something home. So 
that's when it like hit me and like, man, we do a magazine and like at the same time, I didn't want to compete with Sport Compact Car. They're on the newsstand. I wanted the magazine to just go straight to the kid. It was made for that guy going to the show, going to the events. That was my focus. Was like, we're gonna do something. I wanted it to be ultra accessible by the kid and almost at the same time be a decoder to only that the kids would get it, you know, like the peers around us. If some old guy or manufacturer picked it up, you'd, you know, whatever, you know. That's why we started, that's how we started it. And that, you know, was the, that was the leading, you know, the whole, you know, toy machine racing. Message forums are very popular these days and countless forums exist. In the beginning, however, one stuck out. The hybrid board was an internet message forum based primarily on hybrid Honda engine swaps. With the increasing number of people realizing how easy it was to transform their base model Civic hatchback into a high performance race ready vehicle, the board couldn't have come at a better time. The site offered help with wiring as well as other common questions regarding putting dual overhead cam motors into these single overhead cam Civics. It was a relatively small, close-knit community of people who, although sometimes didn't know each other in person, still related to the passion and interest in hybrid Hondas. Many of these original members met some of their closest friends through the hybrid message forum. Well, the hybrid board is what really got me like interested in going to the next level of speed and performance, really. It was definitely a good resource. Totally. A lot of underground guys. Yeah. I mean, when I first joined that board, it was, I got slammed for me being too. a Super Street editor. They were like, what the fuck? But it was, it was good, because I got to, you know, it was kind of like you come into a world where you don't really know, you kind of learn a few things. Yeah, so that's actually a good board to like pay your dues, because, you know, after you've been on that board for a while, they kind of respect you yeah. in some ways. Even if you're like me, they don't. Even if you say something stupid, you know, but yeah, you meet some cool people off there. I was definitely intimidated when I first got on the board. I mean, I, I, my friend Houston was on the board, and he was the guy who actually had the DA that I, that I liked that was stock, and I skated with him. So I went on Cabinet site and then found a link to the hybrid board, and I was just reading through some of the posts, you know, seeing what, seeing what little box. I couldn't register. They wouldn't let you just register, you know. And I, I got my friend Houston's email address because I hadn't contacted him since I left um, Dallas. And I was like, hey, I want to get on hybrid, you know, can you get me a username? Because I tried, they, they had you like answer a question, you know, to like get on hybrid, like back in the day. And I answered the question right, and I still didn't get a password, so I was like, what, the, what, what gives, you know? So um, my friend Houston got me a, got me a password, and um, yeah, I, was, I had to have like, they had to have like 10 like tech posts before you even post in the alley. So like I was all like, you know, scared that they were going to ban me or something if I didn't have all those tech posts. I think about half the people I know today, I mean, I'd say they've all come from the hybrid board, really. I mean, it's just like, it's like family, really. Eric Bauer and Tommy, I didn't know them at all before I got on the hybrid farm. I, I met every, a lot of people, Tony, um, um, that guy over there. I went to high school with a, with a few buddies that, that kind of, we started getting into cars and stuff, but, but after high school, I think, is when my passion, you know, really grew, because a lot of my friends moved away for college, and I was, uh, I was actually at work one day, and uh, I worked at a complex at a coffee shop that had a, a singular wireless next door, and every day there was this, this 94 GSR that was slammed on SI wheels, and this, this 99 black SI that was slammed, you know, and uh, it was totally clean, just simple, you know, the same style as my hatchback, and we would all park next to each other, and it was funny because none of us knew who each other were, but but we'd all park next to each other every day. And then finally one day I'm working and this guy comes in and he's like, hey, what's up, man? Is that your hatchback? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, is that your Integra? And he's like, yeah. And like, so I mean, just a simple hello. And then today is one of my best friends, this a guy, Javon, and, and it was Jeremy. And we all met just because of working in the same complex. And then from there, he was like, tell me about this website, seattleimports.com. So I checked that out and then, uh, my buddy Dave and I just, you know, it was a forum board, just hung out on there, saw what some of the other local people were doing, and I mean, it sounds weird to say that I met them through seattleimports.com, but a lot of my closest friends today were people that I met through cars. You know, we got the internet, found Honda Tech, saw, you know, this whole JDM, you know, styling, you know, just using OEM parts and making it look clean on the US cars, because they, they are a lot different, and I uh, was going from there. I think, yeah, I think the internet has just influenced me myself a lot and it just also just gives you this widespread of being able to see what everybody else is doing and I think it's a great opportunity to you know 
get out and meet different people and then you kind of realize the industry is a lot bigger than your neighborhood and you get to you know have friendly competitions with people and also see kind of what everybody's made of and what they're doing out there and it's just it's a good thing yeah I think I think it's it's good to network I think it's good to you know go out and meet people you got to be careful sometimes with you know who you hang out with and who you build your cars with and who you race with and you know who you associate with but eventually you can you know, you can weed them out. You can you can fine tooth comb who you need to be around and who you don't. And at that point, you can you know do good. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of brought I guess really the right people together, people who are really more into performance. Automotive theft has always been an issue with modified cars, yet the import car scene has elevated it to a whole new level. Although people are aware of the issue itself, not everyone realizes the extent of how bad it is and how much it affects the owners of these project cars. People are always going to want to steal your goods, especially the better you make it, you know, and it, it, at this point it feels like they don't even want to steal it because they want it, they want to steal it because they don't want you to have it. And it's like you take your steering wheel off, you club up, you do whatever. It, it doesn't even matter how, how many alarms you have. They're going to come in with a tow truck and they're going to take your car. And it's a sad realization that you got to think, you know, when you're going to that movie, when you're going to dinner, when you're parking in a lot overnight, that it's like, you know, somebody really wants your stuff, they're going to take it. I always had an alarm or, you know, full coverage insurance on my older cars, but never really was too worried about, like, driving to the movies or dinner, you know. Nowadays, it's like, you, you have, like, any kind of, you know, Type R parts in your car at all, or Type R, it's like, it's impossible to like take it to the movies, you know, because you just know it's gonna get stolen. You can't take a nice car anywhere, you know? And, I mean, it sucks, I mean, that's just the way it is, yeah, really. Like, you can't take a car like that to the movies, what, what's gonna happen, you know? I mean, you're just gonna hope that someone is not into imports when they show up at the movies, you know what I mean? It's like, you might be able to make it up right, but it's flipping the coin, is the car gonna be there when you get back or not, you know? So I gotta buy a beater. You just don't drive around the beater. I could bring it to the movies, but Will I enjoy the movie? I'll be like thinking about my car at the same time. I'd like, I just rather have it be safe at home and don't even have to worry about like sometimes insurance don't even cover all the parts that you put in there, so you gotta think of that in the long run. Yeah. So in my next car, of course, an EK with five lug and B16 and all that good stuff. And I just I can hold on to it because everywhere I'd park it, I'd just cross my fingers. I'd be I'd be having dinner with a friend for like 20 minutes, whatever. I'd have my fingers crossed, or I'd be looking outside. I'd be walking around the grocery store with my fucking steering wheel in my hand, you know, just praying that my car would still be there when I came back out. And just the, the stress it causes, it's not worth it, really. I think it's mandatory to have a garage, you know, for any, any like nice like fixed up car, you know, and it, it sucks because it's just like inevitable. I see on the border every single day like cars getting stolen left and right, especially Type R's. And it's, 
I don't know, I wish it wasn't like that. I mean, I had my Civic stolen a few weeks back. And it destroys the industry to a certain extent because it raises prices and kills prices at the same time. It cost me so much money to, you know, drive a Type R just to insure the thing when it's like, I'm not gonna be racing, I'm not gonna get it stolen, but they don't know and they don't care. So it's gonna go up high because somebody else wants to take my car and everybody else's car for that matter that's the same model. So it's just killer. It destroys the industry. Over the years, many cars featured in magazines and known across the country have been stolen, stripped, and destroyed. That's probably more due to the internet because people just post pictures of their cars everywhere they can. Yeah. Um, and you know what? If someone's going to take it, they're going to take it anyway. So. Yeah, my coupe was stolen in January and I just, I just immediately told myself, you know, never again am I owning a Honda because it's like, around here it's like gold. I parked my car outside of my house because my roommate was asleep and she was, she was blocking my garage. And like my car did mean a lot to me, but it didn't mean enough to like, to like wake up my roommate and tell her to move her fucking car so I could park my shit in the garage, you know? So I just left it out there, auto locked with the alarm, you know, it was as secure as it can get without being towed away, you know? And that's what happened to my car the next morning. I woke up, tried to go to school, I fucking hop out there and my fucking driveway's empty, you know? And I'm just like, like at that point I already knew what happened. I, I knew what happened, you know, I, I just started laughing. Like, you know, I knew this day would come. Like it did hurt me, you know, a little bit, but I mean, the car is just a car, you know? Like the car was my life but the car didn't make who I was, you know. I made, I made that car, that car wouldn't be shit without me, you know. So when we recovered it, a bunch of people were suspicious, like saying, saying that I insurance fraud in my car. So to prove these motherfuckers wrong, uh, we found my wheels on eBay, the Volks E28Ns, and you know, for those who don't know, those are pretty rare wheels and the offset and the, the bolt pattern and, and uh, rim size that, that, that were on my car. So there was only probably like four made that four sets made that I know of. So we found the set on eBay with my exact tires and, you know, coincidentally, the dude's from Washington. So I'm like, you know, those are my motherfucking wheels, you know? So we hit up this dude and pretend like we're, we're an interested buyer. Eventually we won the auction on eBay and we met up with this dude, Sandpan. We met up with him at McDonald's, like 30 of my buddies hiding in McDonald's while my buddy Javon was outside pretending like he was an interested buyer. So once the sand pan cat uh, busted out my wheels, like 30 of us came out from McDonald's, like a little big family, and this motherfucker was scared as shit, you know? And uh, we held him there for questioning, and uh, we flagged down a cop, and the Seattle Police Department confiscated my wheels and uh, got his information, and then they eventually did a search warrant on his house and found the rest of my car parts chilling at sand pans. His crib. I actually got the Civic um, back in 93 and I think I only had it for three weeks. There wasn't even any um, radio in it or whatnot. It was pretty much a stripped down model because I was going to fix it all up anyway. But uh, it was crazy. Yeah, I was actually carjacked at gunpoint by uh, three guys. Wow. <laughs> and, um, you know, luckily, you know, they just took the car and that same night they recovered it and it was actually on the news. It's crazy, you know, it's crazy, but yeah, it's, I mean, they build these cars, you know, anything's a risk though, and you know, you just gotta take precautions. People are going to whole new lengths to protect their hard work and the parts they purchased with hard earned money. This is by far the best thing you can do <laughs> to protect your car from thieves. This is I don't know how to, I don't know how to cock it or shoot it. So I'm not yeah, that's loaded. No oh, okay, yeah, here. It's loaded. Hey, why don't you hand it back to Jeff? Who, Jeff? He's a marksman. While no one film can cover the entire history of this phenomenon, or tell everyone's personal stories, there are definitely many stories to be told. There is a deep history of people who did not modify their cars to fit in with trends or hype. They did, however, modify their cars because it was their true passion.